Good evening and welcome to the July 12, 2016 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll call of the school committee. Here. Here. Present. Present. Here. Present. Present. Thank you very much. Um, we'll begin this evening's meeting as we do each meeting with a public comment period. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak during the public comment? Thought for sure with all those cars out there we would have uh, a line of people, but I guess apparently not. Okay, any <laughs> announcements from members of the school committee? Okay. It's summer, school's out, so. Um, okay, so now we have recommended actions uh, and we have a consent agenda that consists of several minutes that require approval. Uh, the negotiating subcommittee of June 2nd, 2016, uh, and as well as same committee, negotiating subcommittee, June 13th, June 16th, June 22nd, June 23rd, uh, June 23rd B, uh, and then we have the superintendent evaluation team, June 27th, 2016, 16 and then again negotiating subcommittee for June 28th and June 30th we also have a budget transfer to satisfy DESI reporting um, and it is new general supplies account numbers I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda So moved. is there a second second okay seconded by mr. Reed all those in favor of approving the consent agenda please say aye aye, aye. opposed any abstentions Okay, so the consent agenda is approved. Uh, we'll now move into reports and recommendations and we'll begin with a presentation on Jackson Street Library renovations. And I know we have uh, Principal Agna here, um, as well as uh, Tom Douglas and Gavin Grant, who will be making a presentation. Making an exit. Good evening. Um, I am Gwen Agna, principal at Jackson Street School. I was reflecting on this presentation and thinking 20 years ago this week, I started at Jackson Street as the principal. Um, my first day on the job was to inspect all the places in the school where the roof had leaked. And the place I went first was the library. We had probably five garbage cans dotted around the library. They were <coughs> almost full of water and had been discovered after the carpeting had been completely soaked. I remember at the time thinking, one, this isn't the job I thought I was taking. <laughs> I wasn't the one who was going to fix the boiler. But I also thought, this is really a shame because this is the place where we all gather. I know my kids, when they went to the school, felt the library was the center of their experience there. It is a beautiful space, but I did think at the time, we need to do something differently. We have colors and carpeting that was from the 1970s. We still have it, and it's been a f 20 years, but it's been a steady process of first losing a librarian for the library and having it well run by our library ESP to the point where now we are in the process of hiring librarians again for the elementary schools. And we are also poised to finally do some renovations to the library and a redesign. It's something that has been needed for a long time. It's going to require a lot of effort on everyone's part, but we have a very vibrant <coughs> committee of parents and professionals in our district and in our community who are committed to doing this. So I'm just really honored to be able to introduce them tonight. And I think we're going to begin with Jenna, Jenna Lanterman, who is a parent at Jackson Street School and a librarian. Thank you. Thanks. Should we, is there a way to turn down those front row of lights so that the slides will be brighter? Is that too much? I can still read. Okay. Yeah. I'm not doing anything with the slide, so you'll have to hang tight for that. Oh, 
So I'm Jenna Lanterman. I'm a parent at Jackson Street. I'm also a licensed school librarian and part of the Jackson Street School PTO Library Committee. So I'm just here to frame uh, Tom's presentation on our thoughts about how we can revitalize this space in the school. So I wanted to start also by thanking the school committee for recognizing the importance of school libraries by supporting the hiring of certified librarians in the elementary schools. Very heartening to me and I think it's thrilling that that's happening as we're embarking on this um, redesign project. So. At their best, school libraries are community centers and learning commons. The age-old and essential purpose of the school library as a place in which to find a book has not gone away, but it has expanded. Modern libraries are about reading, yes, but they're also about creating and collaborating. They're about the digital and the physical. They are about quiet and noise. The renovated Jackson Street School Library would accommodate this wide array of purposes and ways of learning. In it, students will be able to get comfortable and get engrossed in a book, and they'll also be able to work collaboratively on a research project, create a 3D model, put on a performance. In addition, they'll be able to do things we can't yet anticipate. Libraries are fast changing, and the proposed plans here, which you'll see in a moment, accommodate future changes with flexible and reconfigurable spaces, a hallmark of good modern library design. One particularly exciting aspect of the Jackson Street School Library renovation is the co-location of the technology lab and the library. This will allow for integrated information literacy instruction, focusing on safe and effective online searching, information evaluation, and will fit facilitate the interplay between digital and physical texts and multimedia. And Gabby, I think, is going to elaborate a bit more on how exciting that blending is for the school. Um, through this presentation, we hope you'll see that a redesigned Jackson Street School Library will allow us to launch innovative library programming, build community, and create a true information and literacy hub in the physical heart of the school. And I'm going to pass it over to Tom. <coughs> Hi, my name's Tom Douglas. I'm an architect in uh, Northampton. I have an office downtown, and I've also um, been a parent of a just graduated fifth grader at Jackson Street, so we've been there for six years now. I've uh, been to a lot of presentations in the library, and Gwen asked me about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, to see if I could help uh, think about redesigning the library. They, they had um, gotten a couple of donations was a little bit of money there to start moving forward so we started thinking about well what could we do here we started from zero should we make just a few little changes or should we look at a big picture and so what we've decided that the path we decided to go down is to look at the big picture and then to try to break it up into small phases that we can do over time so the big picture is what you're going to see tonight I'm not going to really dwell on our small first stages. We're just beginning the discussion about that. But this is the big picture. And what I handed out to you earlier are the guiding principles that we've been using um, to design the space. So this is the space as it exists right now. Orange 1975 carpet. Uh, all the furniture is pretty much original. Uh, it's hard to see, but right dead in the middle is the circulation desk. It's a massive piece of uh, cabinetry. Uh, shelves all along the, the sides. In the back there are these uh, stacks, uh, bookcase stacks where people go and kind of hang out to talk or to and annoy the librarian or to re read privately and get away from the crowd. But the main thing, main takeaway from this is it's a big undifferentiated space with a giant piece of furniture in the middle and lighting that is totally undifferentiated. So what I'm going to talk to you about is how can we break the space up into the different um, areas that will support the activities that we're talking about. Um, one thing that we did do, I've, I've held a bunch of workshops in um, Jackson Street. I did it with a fifth grade class twice. I did it with the ESPs and I did it with the teachers. And this is just one page of um, of a little exercise we did with the fifth graders, just asking them a bunch of questions um, about the library, what changes they would make. I asked them to take on another persona 
um, so they could answer in a different way that wasn't just their own personal preferences. So we did a lot of research with the community and the PTO too about what was needed there. But all, behind all the scenes, we're doing a lot of research on what's the, what is happening in the library community these days. And what you saw, what the slides I showed before this were all libraries that were done um, in New York. They're all about 10 years old now. Some of the technology is a little bit old. But these were libraries that done, were done in New York City that, incorporate, that were the beginning of this discussion of how can libraries work in the new century and recognize the fact that reading and technology have come together and influence education to such a great degree. This is the plan as it exists now. You can see on the right-hand wings uh, where there's, there's stacks. Uh, it's an interesting space. It's a diamond shape, so it's easy to um, kind of. I'm just going to walk up here. It's easy to break it up into some different spaces. But there's the circulation desk. These are the stacks. These are big, huge plate glass windows here that view out onto the gardens that are totally hidden by um, <coughs> now. And then this is kind of the big central space. If any um, presentation happens there, it's really right here, and they set up a screen right in front of the circulation desk in that big column. So this is a new plan, the, the big picture plan. So what we're thinking about doing is creating a number of different spaces that can support both collaborative learning and also individual spaces for individual quiet reading areas. Um, one of the big things about new libraries is that, is that they are loud. There's a lot of activity going on in there. And the activity happening in there is what we desire. We want the library to be the hub of the school I'm supporting all different kinds of um, educational purposes. So we're trying to create a lot of different spaces that can um, support many different types of learning. So what I did was we kept the shelves on the, the tall shelves on the side. We took the stacks and moved them here to the middle, but we're they are this tall. We're going to cut them down to this tall here so you can see across them so the librarian and the circulation desk can look across and see what's happening there. But we're subdividing, using those shelves to subdivide the spaces into differentiated areas. This is the big kind of classroom space, but it also can double as a assembly area for a group of about 60 people to watch film or do a presentation. This is like a little living room space for quiet um, reading, but also a group discussion. This is a smaller group area that would be good for um, younger kids. Um, there's window seats all along the window, little small seating. These little green things here are these big uh, foamy, kind of cushiony uh, places to lie down and read. So we're integrating a lot of flexible furniture that's soft and can accommodate all kinds of different postures and sensory needs. Um, one, th one thing that we are proposing is this is the current librarian's office right here. We want to make that into a presentation space. We're going to get rid of the glass right there. Do this tiered seating there so it can become a presentation space, but also double as a place where there can be a green screen and do video productions. You could do, read a book report there. You could do all kinds of different, it can support many different activities there. Pr production of some type of um, uh, project or just a presentation. This little room right here is currently an office for one of the teachers, it's a small office. Um, that's going to become a collaborative space that is for a medium-sized group. And this would probably be the most fitted out room with interactive TV and um, uh, that the laptops can be connected to and so you could do a group project there. Librarian, since her office is gone now, she moves back to this space right here, but then we close off this hallway so that she still can have some backroom space, which they need. Another really big idea is, has to do with technology, and that's taking the computer lab in the school, which is on the second floor, and moving it down to this space right here and opening it up to the main space so that the people, the staff, that's the teachers that are running this can share in the activities going on there so they can coexist and co-mingle and um, uh, support one another. This also would have part of it be a maker space. I'm not sure if many of you know, I'm sure you all know what a maker space is, but there's a big new movement for spaces, and it's just basically a simple table where people can work on robotics or kinds of different kinds of projects. It might be Legos, it might be some type of engineering project, but that could be easily accommodated here. And, and throughout the entire space, 
the furniture is all movable. So we envision the bookshelves being able to be put on casters and pushed out of the way if we need a really big space. These tables here um, are completely movable. So this is an example of the tables that can be grouped together uh, or, or separated apart, but they're very mobile. Um, this is an example of a bookshelf on wheels. I don't know how often the shelves will be moved. Um, I'm gonna, as a little side note, I'm gonna try to work with um, Smith Folk this coming fall to work with them on a project where they could take our library shelves, trim them down, put them on casters, engineer them in a way, in a way so they won't fall over and kill anybody, and, um, and then integrate those back into the library. So we're thinking we're gonna take the books out of the library in the fall, um, reconfigure the shelves, redo the floor, and then bring the books back in and the new librarian will um, rearrange all the books, which really, uh, they, organ they need a new organization now. Um, so I'll just like, Gabby, yeah, this is an example of how technology can um, be integrated into the library because that's such a big ish, uh, big need now. So some of you may know I'm the assistive tech specialist in the district and I was also a principal intern with Gwen this year. And my project that I had to complete for one of my tasks was getting the community involved in something that's going on in the school. And I happened upon one of uh, Tom's focus groups in the library where he was asking the kids questions about what they would love to see in a new library. And it was pretty evident to me that many of them had never seen a library other than the one they were in. And so extrapolating or guessing what a future library might look like was really difficult. And so I saw that Tom was working with um, a book that I, I had read that was uh, based on the New York libraries about 10 years ago and I wanted to make sure that he had all the latest and greatest as well and that uh, we weren't looking at banks of computers and, and desktop tables. So it was a way for me to finish my project and get involved in this as well. So the things that we looked at really were the collaborative spaces, the flexibility, and the fact that the lab comes close, we have an integration specialist, we have a library person, and we have teachers, some who have uh, their two feet solidly in the 21st century, and some who still have a foot or a few toes a little bit in the past, and this would give some co-teaching ability, so that a teacher who wasn't so comfortable with the technology had many around that could help with that process. And so that seemed really important. So to make sure that library is still about books and information and also technology opens up that universally designed to access for all students. And that was something that was really important. The other piece that I worked on was how we could expand the, co the collection to include all of the cultural and multilingual uh, families that we have, at least at the Jackson Street School, which happens uh, is, is growing population throughout the district. And so I worked also on a project about um, working with some parents to develop a collection around fairy tales so that whether a refugee family came without books, came without formal schooling, came without the ability to read and write in their own language, they could share picture books, they could share early readers, and they could share uh, adult level books with their kids and share those with others. So those were the two pieces of the project that I got involved with, and I'm really thrilled to see that this is uh, coming together very nicely. So, thanks. So I just, the slides you, sh you saw earlier were just examples of how collaborative spaces can occur. Group desks, um, uh, uh, whiteboards, we have these shown throughout the space or designed throughout the space. Look at, see the chairs that these guys are sitting on? They're on wheels. I mean, these are really popular and um, not so much lecture classrooms in colleges now, but in classrooms that have a more collaborative structure. So people do work in groups, so the chairs can move, over, they support a laptop, they have a little uh, tablet uh, shelf on them, and then they're on wheels and they can move around and you can group them in many different ways. Uh, and then this is a great example of that one room I was talking about that was kind of a medium-sized group where people can bring a laptop, work on projects together, and then project it onto a TV screen, and the teacher can lead the discussion. So these are just some other um, quick views of the, the design that we put together. This is looking out towards one of the gardens on the south side, and if you see the, the teacher standing up right in the middle in black, behind her is a big whiteboard 
that will be on tracks and can slide back and forth across there. So that can be used as a writing board, a whiteboard, or a projection screen, because this is where all the large group um, presentations will be and meetings. So that's the largest uh, uh, sort of pull, not a pull down screen, but projection area. And then these little whiteboards will be spread throughout the area, and then there are uh, tables that can be grouped together in different ways. Um, this is kind of a view looking back the other way. And this is the little small seating area with little low cushions and looking out the window to the um, garden courtyard that uh, faces north. And this is the entry area coming from the kindergarten wing where you walk into the seating area, which is a cozy. One of the biggest things that all, every single kid asked for, we said, what do you want in the library? Is they said a cozy chair. And right now there's one couch in the library. It's right in the middle. And um, I've sat there and watched four kids, it's not, it's like a five foot long couch, four kids squeeze into it and they eventually squeeze one out and he has to go somewhere and then they all spread out and take up all the room and he can't come back and sit down. So, so we'll have many different seating opportunities that are mobile. This is the new plan and uh, I think that's it. So. so I just wanted to wrap it up by saying we are, we've embarked on a fundraising campaign. We've done Valley Gives, we have some private donations, and we have had approval for up to an amount for, to be gifted to us for this project. It's likely in the various stages to be a total at the end of a significant amount of money, as you can imagine, but we are trying to break it up into doable pieces. We're hoping that we'll be able to talk with the city about uh, capital improvements as well, and I know that there are a lot of um, things on the list, but it is definitely a capital improvement that is a long time coming, I think, for the elementary schools. I know that Bridge Street is also embarking on a redesign and renovation. We all recognize the importance of the library and also the fact that we do work with specialists in our elementary libraries really makes this a perfect opportunity. So you'll hear more along the way and um, we really appreciate the opportunity to let you know what's happening so far. If you have any questions for any people, please let us know. Thank you. Any questions from members of the school committee? Uh, Ms. Fallon. Um, the only question, it wasn't clear to me from that old room, I don't know how to describe it, to the right that had most of the technology you said, is that going to have doors that lock for when we let and other members of the community use the library space? Is that something that can be separated? Um, I'm not sure. Because they looked big and open in the, yeah. in the plan. There, and there is that one area that would be big and open, and there's a couple places uh, we would have to think about. Yeah, that's the, the lab we could actually, if there were movable pieces, we could put in there and close that door. Because right. there, there will be a door right with it. Door. Okay, because it didn't look like closing doors in the picture, so that's yeah. all, that, that would be my only thing was it looks like the technology was really centered in that one area, that it'd be nice if we could close that off for when people reserve the library for meetings and stuff, just yeah, if we we're going to have expensive equipment. That's a good point, yeah, we can do that. I know most of the laptops that go around on carts and right. they, they'd be put away. They're locked away. Yeah. Can I speak to that too? You may also consider leaving it open and that being a possible place for folks to look for jobs that don't have computers or access at home or kids to do homework because we tend not to give that uh, internet-based homework when, when kids don't have access at home. So it, it's possible that that could be a very useful space. And if those are the desktop machines, things aren't really going to walk away. Any other questions or comments? Dr. Baird. I'd be interested to hear more about some long-term planning um, so we can see how this kind of renovation could happen at all four of the elementary schools. Because um, my concern would be the same kinds of concerns I heard after the Bridge Street large gift with technology. So this is great for Bridge Street School, but what about the other elementary schools? And so this is really exciting. I would love to see some long-term planning and see how this is going to work for the other three schools as well. We are about to embark on a large-scale renovation of the Ryan Road cafeteria yeah. uh, next year, so uh, we are trying to do renovations in all of our schools. So, but I'll I let, think some I'll of let the ideas that we're developing now can translate to the other schools, and we'll be 
like the guinea pig, if we can get started soon. We can sort through many of these different ideas and you'll have a template to move on with. So. Yeah. My concern is, is also just around the breakdown of funding, how much is getting funded through PTOs, how much is being funded through, through the district, mm -hmm. and just PTO's ability to raise money. Yep. Can I, Dr. Provost? As you know, I had asked you to come forward tonight before the committee because we're going to put a hole in the wall. <laughs> And I just wanted the committee to be aware of that. Could you just clarify so everyone is aware what that first phase of the first project is that we sure. will be doing this summer? Um, so this summer, uh, trying to think back of the schedule because it's very late in the summer right now for any kind of construction project. Uh, we would, we'd like to create the hole in the wall between what will be the, the computer lab uh, maker space and it's not going to be the full-blown final opening, but we'd like to put a hole there to connect that, that big space that I showed you to the main library. Um, we'd like to uh, begin to prepare for uh, the removal of all the books and the replacement of the floor. One of the big things that, the first step really, besides putting a hole in the wall, and it's a concrete block wall, so if we can just cut out a door-shaped opening, we're not taking out a big chunk of wall. But um, the, as Ms. Agna said, the carpet is from 1975. Uh, we'd like to replace that with a, a hard floor, a, um, probably marmoleum floor with different colors. I mean, you saw some of those earlier pictures with all the different colors in the library. So we've got to sort through those design ideas. But so the next stage after the hole in the wall is um, move the circulation desk, take it apart take part of it and move it back to the new, new location. In the fall, at the end of the fall, remove all the books, have the bookshelves cut down, um, reconfigured, and then bring it all back in during the break uh, while the new floor is being installed. So uh, take out the books, install the floor, and then put the books back in and rearrange them in a different way. So the process we're hoping will happen uh, next month through January. All those things could happen. So we're, we're sorting through how we can break those little bits up. But it's not a huge uh, change to the library, a new floor and, a, and an access point to another classroom, and then reconfigured furniture. Um, we won't be able to buy new furniture. We're just going to have to take what we have and put it in the places that you know, we're hoping to have furniture in, new furniture. So, so it's a small first step. Okay. And if I may just add to your answer to notify the public before we do any of that, we're doing some hazmat testing to see if we need to do any abatement during the uh, demolition phase of the project. Right. Yeah, the carpet is just uh, laid on a concrete slab, but there's a chance, a small chance, that the glue could um, be toxic or hazardous. So we're testing that. Mr. Meyer? Um, well, I'm cognizant of what Mr. Dr. Baird mentioned about, you know, allowing equal opportunity for <coughs> elementary schools. I just want to thank the Jackson Street community again for moving forward with a great project, which I think, um, you know, I've seen Tom before Community Preservation Committee doing so much work to improve this community. And this is going to be, I think, a model. Um, and, it, and especially the fact that it's being built out in a way that recognizes resource constraints. Um, you know, and, and so it, it's going to bring immediate improvement, and I think that other schools, even with limited resources, could look at those immediate improvements and look at this design and, and move toward it as well, um, even, even though we as a district are unable to support a lot of these things. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Thank we're you. hoping that this very first phase of reconfiguring the furniture and getting a new floor will create an excitement that will help us to raise some more money because obviously we've got to raise a lot more money for this in many different, from many different sources, um, donations and, and, and possibly something from the school. But we're hoping that we can do a little bit of work and then show a glimmer of what it could be and then have a small capital campaign to raise some money from the public to get, to take another look, the next little step. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Okay, um, 
So the next item on the agenda is a presentation uh, from uh, the regarding the charter school parent survey results and Dr. Provost and uh, parent community member and parent Mark Watts are going to make that presentation. Good evening. In addition to introducing Mark, I just wanted to say that um, this survey really is a culmination of an ambition I've had for five years. And you might say, well, you've only been here for two years, so <laughs> how is that possible? Um, but I can tell you that in my prior district, there was also um, a concern about people choosing other options than their local public school and a desire to do a survey, um, which I did not have the support of, um, of someone who was, was skilled at, at doing survey research and so I was never able to do that. I'll, I'll say one thing I learned from this process before turning it over to Mark is that getting the charter school data was really about building relationships for me. Um, because people have chosen, for whatever reason, to educate their students in another school, and then the public school is coming forward with a survey saying, why don't you fill this out and tell us why? Um, I think it, initially there's a little bit of resistance. Um, and so for me it was an opportunity to work with the administrators of the local charter schools to try to begin a dialogue with parents from Northampton who educate their students in charter schools and say, look, it, this isn't a trick. We really just want to know why because we think the information can help us be stronger. We think the information can be helpful to you in making your school stronger. So would you please just um, participate? And I think that was um, well received in the end. Um, we did get some anecdotal information that's not part of the survey from parents who were grateful that they had been asked in the end. And um, I certainly have a better sense of collaboration with local charter school leaders and understanding of the different models they're providing. Um, and I hope that I've begun the process of laying a foundation for relationships that will be um, very supportive for parents as they bring their children back because one of the things you'll note in the survey is that most of the parents who are educating their children at charter schools are planning to bring them back to the Northampton Public Schools. So I want them to know that there is a partner waiting for them in relationship on the other side. So with that, I think I'll just turn it over to Mark to uh, talk about the results we found. Hello. So um, let me just give you the, the, um, the basic uh, background on this. Um, the survey was conducted online. Uh, we did it with, uh, we worked together with the public school district uh, to put together a, a, um, a questionnaire that made sense. Letters were sent out to charter school uh, and public school district choice parents asking them to take the survey. Uh, and the survey was open from January 28th to May 6th. It was open for a long time as we really tried to do a lot of follow-up to try to increase the, the um, number of parents uh, taking the survey. Uh, we did a lot of word of mouth uh, efforts, uh, et cetera, to improve that completion rate. Uh, uh, nonetheless, there was not really enough district choice parents to, to break them out or to look at them separately. So we decided to focus just on the charter schools um, as, as a, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Provost has said it's, it's easier to get to uh, the charter school administration or to groups there. The, the parents who are going off to a different district tend to be much more on their own uh, without other families around to, to, to encourage them to take the survey. Um, so that just proved to be more difficult. Um, if a respondent or a parent who took the survey had uh, more than one child in the charter school, we asked them questions about the oldest and the youngest child, if they had three, it was just going to be too burdensome, too long of a survey to ask about all three, so we just said the oldest and the youngest. Um, uh, so the unit of analysis in this survey and this presentation I'm giving is not the household, it's the student. So those households with more than one student are going to have a, 
a greater representation in the survey. There's a total, uh, that should change actually, there's a total not of 133, there's a total of 113 stu children who are represented in this survey um, uh, from, from 76 households. I thought I changed that, which is concerning to me now. Um, so uh, how they broke down by, uh, uh, by district, uh, I mean by, by charter school, and this survey, two thirds of them came from Hilltown. Our, we definitely had the best response from Hilltown uh, Cooperative School. Uh, uh, Pioneer Valley uh, Chinese Immersion was 14% of our respondents. Uh, children going to, to I'm, I'm sorry, 18% of our respondents. Children going to PVPA is 14% and we have one respondent went to Four Rivers Charter School. Um, we asked them what grade is your child presently attending? Um, 50, 55% uh, are in elementary schools, 31% in middle, 16% in high school. Um, uh, uh, so some background here on uh, uh, the, <coughs> the, the parents uh, of, um, uh, and the families in the charter schools. We asked, did you ever visit a Northampton public school before deciding to send your child? to a school outside the Northampton Public School District. Um, overwhelmingly, 84% said yes, they had done that. Um, I, I, should, I should add that uh, throughout the survey, there are different, there are four different schools here that are represented, m mostly three, right? Four Rivers is only one respondent. Uh, and it's mostly Hilltown uh, of those three. But um, and I didn't break out the results by school in this presentation because the sample gets kind of small and I'm a little leery about talking about those data with that exactitude. But um, looking at the data and looking at how it breaks down by school, there are differences, right? Not all schools are the same in how they respond to these. So the degree which I see those differences, I'll, I'll speak to them. Um, and in this particular instance, for example, uh, people who went to Bi Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion were far less likely to have visited the school um, prior. Uh, uh, um, uh, did you pursue open enrollment in the public school system? Most did not pursue open enrollment. Those who did, 14%, 10% uh, said they were not successful in the pursuit of open enrollment, which is choosing a different public school within the system. Uh, did your child ever attend a public school within the Northampton Public School District? 29% um, uh, said yes, um, they had uh, attended a public school. Those overwhelmingly come from PVPA. Uh, uh, they they uh, are uh, far less likely to come from Chinese immersion, and it's a little bit, yeah, um, a little bit less than that with with Hill, uh, Hilltown. Um, so these are the grades in which they were in before, uh, in Northampton Public Schools before, um, uh, grades that they had attended. So obviously there were more in kindergarten as the years go on. Those children get pulled out of the public school system into a charter school. Um, uh, this data hasn't been updated. The, um, the, uh, uh, when we asked them which Northampton Public School uh, did your child attend for those who attended the, uh, an elementary school. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, it's split. Uh, there's more from uh, Leeds and Jackson Street uh, than Bridge or Ryan Road. Uh, and again, most of those, a lot of those are ones who ended up going to um, PVPA, although some of them also went to Hilltown. Um, how likely is it that you will send your child to a Northampton public school in the future year or grade level? Uh, um, uh, overwhelmingly, 60% say uh, almost likely or more than likely. Uh, almost certainly or more than likely. So, uh, uh, two out of, uh, three out of five say that they will do that. Again, uh, if we pull out Pioneer Valley um, Performing Arts a High School, they're much less likely to say that. Um, uh, they're more likely to have been in the public schools originally, but less likely to say they're coming back because they're at the end of their K through 12 experience. But so these are overwhelmingly, when they say almost certainly or more than likely, they're actually overwhelmingly Hilltown. They're less likely to be Chinese immersion as well. Um, okay, so here's the family background of the charter school student. Uh, how many adults were part of the decision about where to send your child for school? 
uh, something happened there. Those are that's that's uh, one percent and two percent, uh, or, or two percent and three percent, and then ninety five percent. Uh, Ninety-five percent of the families who send their kids to charter school students, we didn't ask them how many adults in the household. We just asked how many adults were making decisions about where to send the child to, for education. Um, but ninety-five percent of the uh, children who go to off the charter schools um, have at least two have have two uh, parents making decisions about their education. Um, uh, what is the highest level of education among adults outside the uh, in, in or out the household who are making responsible for <coughs> making decisions about your child's education? Um, this is, I think, is a pretty uh, amazing graph. Actually, um, eighty percent say a graduate degree, uh, twenty percent say college graduate. Uh, none of the charter school children in this survey uh, are in households where the highest level of education among the parents is some college. Uh, an associate's degree or high school graduate or, or less, um, which makes it very different from a public school population. 80% um, graduate degree is definitely very different. Um, what is the approximate uh, annual income for your household? 46% uh, have an a annual income uh, of over $100,000 a year. 6% uh, have an annual income of under 50. Um, I try to state there in the red uh, what, what eligibility is for, um, uh, for free and reduced lunch, which makes up 34% 30, of Northampton Public School students. It's, um, it's uh, 45000 for a family of four, 37000 for a family of three. I don't, don't have income thresholds that allow me to know who among these would meet that definition. It's somewhere between none and maybe 5%. Uh, uh, of, of these respondents would be eligible for free and reduced lunch as opposed to 34% in the public school district. Um, again, uh, this differs a little bit from school. Uh, Hilltown is more likely to, Hilltown has all of those who are under 50,000. Um, uh, uh, and the Pioneer Valley uh, Char uh, Chinese Immersion School, half of the respondents had an income over $150,000. Uh, how many years have you lived in Northampton? Uh, you know, one, one theory, one theory about, um, sorry about some of the numbers disappearing there. One theory about the, um, uh, about who chooses charter schools is they're, they're new to town. They're less uh, invested in, in the local public schools and, and more likely to, to look for something outside the town. Um, that really doesn't seem necessarily to be the case. I don't know how it compares to the school body here, but they're not, necessarily new here. It's, it's really around 30, 28 uh, percent uh, who have less than 10 years of, uh, of living in Northampton. Um, uh, did the adults who are making the decisions about your child or children's education attend public school as a child? Um, uh, 57 percent all the parents who, uh, who are making decisions attended public school completely and only. 84% um, have at least one parent who, attend, who attended public school at some point. Um, only 13% uh, had at least one parent with some non-public -edu education, and only 1% uh, uh, were all the parents' um, background not public education. So the background of the parents is they overwhelmingly they come from public education themselves. How much would you say at least one parent in the household currently volunteers for your child's school? Um, as you can see there, and again, the value disappeared on that. Uh, the, 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 the percentage saying that they uh, volunteer is huge uh, compared to, um, it's, uh, these are kinds of questions that can be over, overstated. I certainly know a number of parents who think that they're involved in our local public school. Um, I wouldn't call it that. Um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, it's far greater, I'm sure, than if we asked parents in the public schools at present. The, there, here is another big difference between the schools, however. It's far lower, this answer, with Chinese immersion, for example, than it would be for um, Hilltown. Hilltown, this is a much, much larger um, uh, percentage involvement. is 53% saying that they're a great deal involved and 21% um, uh, 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 no, that's not right. 31% um, say they're a great deal involved, and 31% say there will be some involved. 
Um, so the next set of uh, the next set of slides are going to go into the reasons uh, why uh, the factors that people made these decisions. All right. We asked about 20, 20 uh, reasons why people might make a decision of sending their child to charter school over Northampton Public School. All right. And I'm going to start with the ones that had the highest response and we'll go down the list. Uh, we won't get to all of them. There will be a few that, that were not at all relevant and I won't, I won't bother with those. Um, but the strongest uh, two by far um, is the school uh, that we choose offers services, classes, or a curriculum that was uniquely suited for our child. Um, and we were concerned that the size of the classes or, or school was too large and wanted a smaller, more personable, and or more comfortable environment for our child. All right. the, um, uh, the, first the first item up there is, is overwhelmingly much more for, um, for schools like Chinese immersion, actually, and um, uh, performing arts. Right? Something unique, uh, special about that school and good for my child. Less so for Hilltown. Um, the, the class size is overwhelmingly for over, not at all for uh, Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion uh, and much, much more for Hilltown. I, I found that personally, because my sense of public schools in Northampton is uh, our focus, if anything, is to keep class sizes low m more than other districts. And I, they don't seem especially high. So that being the reason uh, surprised me. And I had a slide, and it's not in here, uh, that shows the uh, class sizes for um, uh, um, for for the the various uh, um, charter schools and for the public schools and the Hilltown uh, charter school uh, class size is 25 students per class where it ranges around 18 to 21 in the various elementary schools in um, Northampton. Uh, so it's. It's interesting why that would that would be uh, an answer so high in the list, especially high in the list for Hilltown. Chinese immersion has much smaller class sizes relative uh, to both Northampton and, of course, Hilltown, and they're less interested or less likely to cite that as the major reason for going to Chinese immersion. Um, okay, so the next two uh, up there, as you if you remember from the previous, it's nearly half saying this is a major and close to 70 or 75 percent saying it's at least a somewhat for those first two we talked about. The next two, it drops down a bit. You have a, you know, 38, 41 percent saying major, and another third saying it's a somewhat of a factor in their decisions. First being it was less about the local public schools our child would have to attend, and more about hearing good things about the school we ended up choosing. Again, that's a bit more for perform, uh, the performing arts and the Chinese immersion than it is for the Hilltown. Uh, uh, the Northampton schools uh, did not have as interesting or as diverse a curriculum at uh, the school my child is now attending was, the, was another one. That's, so these are uh, not as top as the, the two we saw, but still obviously a very dominant reason for most people choosing charter schools. Um, next is uh, uh, two items where it's a little bit lower, uh, 39, 36 saying major. Another uh, 17, 21 percent saying somewhat. The schools seemed more receptive to the needs of parents and students than Northampton schools. Um, this, this is overwhelmingly a choice of Pioneer Valley Performing Arts, actually. We liked the fact that the parents were more involved in the school and that the school was more encouraging of parents volunteering and participating. This is, is a major reason uh, among Hilltown cooperative parents. Um, how much of a factor was, uh, again, uh, th here's the next three in the list. Um, uh, uh, we were concerned about budget cuts uh, and the threat of cutting programs like arts in the Northampton School. The school we choose seemed to have more children learning at a higher level. Uh, we visited a Northampton Public School and came away unimpressed with what we saw or heard. So roughly 20 to 24 percent there saying major uh, and another uh, 20, 26 to 29 percent saying somewhat. These three reasons tend to be a bit more for Hilltown. These is uh, the Hilltown, in essence, the, the, the Pioneer Valley and the Chinese Immersion would talk more about the aspects of their particular school they're going to and its uniqueness for their child. Uh, the Hilltown is a bit more likely to focus on 
things like uh, um, uh, the um, uh, unimpressed of, with a visit or budget cuts. The, China, the children learning at a higher level, however, that one is much bigger with Chinese immersion. Um, as is in the next slide, um, I wanted my child to be academically challenged and Northampton schools did not offer a sufficient advanced and challenging curriculum for the more academically gifted prepared students. That's much more Chinese immersion response than any of the other two schools or three schools. Um, uh, and we had heard per, uh, of we had he heard of or personally experienced ineffectual teachers or administrators in the Northampton schools. Um, uh, a bit more with Pioneer Valley Performing Arts, which had had been in the Northampton Public Schools more often than the others, uh, but also high with Hilltown Charter. Uh, now we're getting down to the, we're definitely getting down to some of the least major concerns. You can see here with these. Uh, under 20% saying major, uh, under 50% saying at least somewhat. Uh, but still some people saying it. Um, still some people thinking it's a factor. We had anticipated, heard of, or personally experienced too many behavior problems among students in the classroom at Northampton. We were concerned about bullying and the physical or emotional safety of my child in the Northampton schools. We were concerned about the emphasis on testing in Northampton schools. These tend to be much more of a Hilltown response than the other two schools. Um, uh, and the bottom of the list that we have here, of the ones that we're even showing. Um, uh, we were concerned about the test results and the fact that the district was designed by the state as level three on the basis of some of these scores. So basically the whole uh, um, concern about the testing and the level three isn't what drives uh, uh, many people, if any people, um, to, to charter schools. Um, we have friends, neighbors who are sending their children to the same school and we choose, uh, we have chosen, we like the idea of being there together. There was a hypothesis when we started this survey that there was some social capital aspect of things where people were living in the same neighborhood, learning all about the charter school in, in sort of as a group or in the same uh, daycare uh, or preschool um, or parent center and, and, and that motivating them to, to, to do it. That does not seem to be a major factor. Uh, and lastly, on the very bottom, we felt that there was more accountability on teacher performance in charter schools and we appreciate the fact that poor performing teachers uh, can more easily be fired, didn't show up as a reason, the sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, right wing argument in, uh, for charter schools that <laughs> I would say um, uh, doesn't, doesn't, isn't what moves Northampton parents uh, to choose charter schools. Um, so basically to sum up, uh, these are parents who are, who were or are quite open to the idea of Northampton Public Schools. Uh, a, ma a vast majority of charter school parents visit uh, uh, Northampton Public Schools. Uh, one, of, uh, one of three choose charter schools after having their child been in the, the public schools. And, and for those who aren't, they're far more likely to actually say they're going to be sending their kids to, there's a very high chance that they'll be sending their kids to, uh, to, to, to school after their, their charter school is done. Uh, the parents' education background shows uh, uh, that they're overwhelmingly public. Um, charter school students come from families with much higher social economic status, um, a remarkably high level of education among parents. Right? So they're very, very different, the uh, parents, than the public school population. This is the point of this particular summary slide. They, they are considerably higher household incomes, dramatically different in that way. Nearly all children have two adults involved in the decision making on education. Uh, and, and parents are far more likely to volunteer uh, and get involved in the school. Right. Uh, and finally, uh, parents are um, primarily choose the schools um, for the diverse and interesting curricula that the schools offer and not for the attention and for the attention, support, and openness to involvement of, of parents and students. And as we've talked about, there are some there's some differences by schools. We have three schools that offer three different things and parents are motivated in different re reasons to go into those three schools. Budget cuts, the lack of children learning at a higher level and discouraging visits are also an issue. Um, the lack of an academic challenge or an ineffectual teacher administrations uh, are big issues for some. Uh, behavior and bullying are, are not non-issues but they're not, uh, the, they're not the major factors that drive in testing teacher accountability are not really what's driving people uh, to charter schools. All right.
That's it. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mark. Um, are there questions from members of the school committee about the um, about the survey or the results? Mr. Reed? Oh, I'm sorry. This you can go ahead, Mr. Reed. Okay. Uh, well, Mark, I think this is awesome that you did this. Thank you so much. It's really great to have data that we can then, you know, work from. And um, my question for you is whether it's possible for you to kind of crunch down more as we, you know, like can we do another iteration of your analysis? Um, because, for instance, um, it seems like there are two different groups. There are the people who don't even really go look at our schools or try them who choose charter schools. So that solving that problem is different from the problem of uh, parents or students who are in the district and then choose to go somewhere else. So, so I'd sort of, if it was possible, I'd love to see those two kind of broken apart. And then the other thing I'm curious about is is that the the, the problem of sort of people choosing to go to charter schools K through eight is probably a different decision and a different sort of problem to address than the people who are choosing to go in the later grades. So it's just, can we like put questions well, to the I superintendent and there's, there's <coughs> I mean, part of the issue is there's three schools and there are three separate problem, problems to address to address the, the parents of those three schools. That's one. Uh, that's two is actually most of those parents or a big proportion of those parents who were once in the Northampton Public Schools and left um, uh, are PVPA students. Uh, there are some Hilltown, it gets to be a small group to look at that group specifically. Those who uh, went to public, Northampton Public Schools and left to PVPA. Um, I don't know that they would differ a lot, but I can look at them separately if you want. Yeah, that, that's um, the question is can we, can, is it possible for you to <coughs> to like break out different I, analyses? Looking at the data and looking through it, I don't know that there'd be a dramatic difference between those who chose Hilltown from the get-go and those who left. Although they were more likely to say things like, I've experienced an ineffectual teacher uh, than someone who never went to Northampton Public Schools in the first place. But other than that, um, uh, because the chance of them having that uh, is higher. Um, uh, uh, other than that, I, 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 I can certainly look at it, but it's a smaller group, like I said, who went right. to Hilltown. N almost none went to Chinese Immersion. I think I had two interviews who went to, Ch who went to Northampton Public Schools at the very early years and then went to Chinese Immersion. Chinese Immersion is a kind of a school where I don't think you can get in very easily in third or fourth or fifth grade. Um, uh, uh, so the, um, uh, but we can take a look at it and see what's great. There. Sure. Thanks. Ms. Bixansky. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. It was really great, very informative. Um, so I'm wondering, so what percentage of 100, you spoke to parents of 133 children? And no, it was 113, 133. 113, right. But, um, and what percentage is that of the overall? I don't know, number? actually. That's a good question. And that's all the children. That's, that. that's, it's about 63%. So it's, it's more than half. That's a good response rate. And that excludes on purpose, on design. I'm a middle child. I always feel put down as a middle child. We <laughs> ignored the middle childs in this as well because it just got to be too burdensome to ask about three or four children. My middle child um, was the exactly, same. Exactly, exactly. So we, you know, some of those not in here are that. They're in the same family. We got data from that family. Right. But we don't have the data on the middle child. Right. We figured if there are different yeah. motivations of why they would be at the far, at the oldest and the youngest, and, and again, so burdensome to have them take it for three children. Right. Um, so 67% <coughs> is a pretty good response rate, I would say, for a web survey. Yeah. Um, and do you think there was any kind of self-selection that ended up with those kind of such high numbers in terms of income and education level? Uh, I, 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 I certainly am always fearful of, of self-selection, uh, especially in a web survey. Um, uh, I'm, uh, 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 you know, we sent a letter out to everybody, um, but, but, you know, that's never good enough when it comes to a web survey. We didn't have their email addresses, email addresses. 
Um, and then we tried to word of mouth follow up. Again, they've talked to the administration. We, I think, John, uh, Dr. Provis can, can correct me here. I think we got more Hilltown as a proportion than we did in the other school. That's correct. Right. Um, now, uh, I, given the fact that we got 67% of the entire population, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's gonna lead to a big skew on things like education and income. Right. Which were dramatic in their differences, at least from public school population in North Haven. Right. And you could, we could probably compare those numbers to DESE information on sort of economically disadvantaged, right? I don't think there's a, gra I don't think there's any kind of education question. DESE doesn't not. collect any kind no. of education, parents' education. No, there, there is information on economically disadvantaged students. Right. There's information on any of the other categories of students, but nothing about parents. That was just really interesting. And then last, just point of information, I believe Hilltown has two teachers per class and that might be why the class size is so large and that it's a mixed grade class so I think that's could be I, I know nothing about that and, and it would make sense that, that was a yeah. reason to choose it other questions for for Mark I just have really more comment um, I've been in an email exchange back and forth with the director for our principal at Hilltown and one of the things that she had said was she was impressed that we were asking these kinds of questions and we're reaching out. And also um, a charter school parent, a Hilltown parent, said the same thing to me. They were impressed that we were seeking this information. Um, and I just think this information combined with the QSORT information is going to be a really valuable data set. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of confirming or non-confirming or conflicting what comes out of that? We were really excited about that, but just kudos to us. Thank you so much. Um, but kudos to the schools for reaching out and getting this data. Definitely. Uh, two more questions, um, Mr. Meyer, and then so Tennessee. Uh, Mark, I know in your day job you not only do the surveys, but then also you're working with people who are trying to motivate people to make a choice, um, and it's voters. But you know, I'm wondering just in terms of what. What are our next steps? I mean, I, you know, just looking at the DESI profiles, um, the the playing field is clearly not level. Um, you know, the da your data confirms what you can see on the DESI profiles in terms of um, ELL numbers at at you know PBPA and and Hilltown, the ELL numbers are zero. Um, you know, that's and we're we're about you know we're a district that's about to serve the needs of of Syri Syrian refugee children. Um, and, and again, that's, you know, that's something that we do willingly, that's something that's part of the mission of public education, but it means that in terms of um, our, our budget that we have to plan differently than, than those institutions. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, that's, a, that's a different conversation that, that has to happen with our legislature, our governor, um, and will happen at the ballot box in November. But in terms of trying, you know, I, I look at a lot of those questions and having not so long ago been a young parent, there's a lot of what you perceive and then there's, and what you hear, and then there's the reality. And again, it's interesting to me that, you know, so many of these parents are making choices relatively, you know, at the very beginning of their child's education. Um, and uh, how can we, how can we convince them? How can we provide information, like you said, for instance, um, you know, even if the class size, even if there are two teachers per classroom, um, in our kindergartens, there's a, you know, a veteran ESP um, in the classroom uh, for every kindergarten section. So how can we provide them with the information to try to influence them? And again, we're not going to get 202 students returning um, because student, you know, teachers, you'll always perceive the need for your child. You always see, you know, do what's right for your child. But um, even some of them uh, to try to get back some of that $2.1 million that, that we lose each year. So I'm wondering, you know, is that, is that in the works? Um, Mark and I had a long conversation about this. Um, to a certain extent, I think there are things that the public schools can do and make sense to do, and then there are some things that may be beyond our reach. <coughs> I think one of the things that um, we certainly can do is talk more about our class sizes, which really are favorable. Um, you know, they, they may not be always the lowest, but they're certainly comparable to most of the charter schools that people are choosing, and if they're choosing it because of class size, maybe there's an in information gap about the class sizes that we're providing for students. Um, the other thing that, that um, comes up um, strongly to me is the 
the, the response about the diversity of the curriculum. Um, and I think that's really important at the elementary schools, um, especially since the vast majority of our children are out at the elementary grades. Um, you know, one of the things that I had said during the budget process is I kind of wish I had some of this data earlier. I think we might have made different choices. I think we might have made, I might have recommended different choices around art and music um, in particular. But um, now that we have the information, we can think about it. You know, we can talk to parents more. We can um, have a public discussion about what we're doing with curriculum. In some ways, it is not surprising that curriculum was one of the high, um, high drivers on the list because curriculum is one of the things that we've identified in the entry findings in the district improvement plan as one of our own deficits. So maybe that was a true perception, but we have to talk about what we're doing to correct that. Do you have a follow-up? Oh, just, just a quick follow-up. There's that, you know, with the people in front of me, in terms of you know Hilltown, one of one of the reasons people choose is their ability to get involved in the schools, and and I know that you know, Mark, Mark has been so involved in in all the school communities, whether it's Bridge Street or now JFK, and you know the same for the Jackson Street. I mean, these are dynamic school communities that are so involved in making our elementary schools great places for their kids. And so if we're not doing enough to make that clear that those opportunities, are, I mean, there's more than enough opportunity um, that, and, and great groups of people that bring all sorts of talent together, um, you know, and, and, you know, I know, and bring, you know, come to CPC, come, you know, come to all sorts of uh, individuals and funding organizations to make things happen regardless of the, the financial constraints that we have as a school committee. And that's, that's a strength of our system and it ha has to be put at the front. I have a I have a small classroom hypothesis um, <laughs> I'd like to throw out there, okay. which is that um, I know in my experience uh, with two children that have gone through, they're now both in JFK, gone through Bridge Street, uh, two years apart, that one entered with a very small class size and the next one entered with a much larger class size. And I know that the population ebbs and flows in pretty bizarre ways within just uh, you know the the section that is Bridge Street. Right, where one year you're afraid that there's not enough population to support a school and the next year you're worried about two, you know, class sizes that are too large and making three kindergartens in Bridge Street instead of two and the like. Um, sure. Charters don't have that problem. They can accept who they need to accept to meet the class size that they're looking for. Yeah. So it's certainly possible that somebody enters a school that happened to have a surge in class size, looks around and see 25 students, uh, even though last or a few years ago it was just 14, and decide that elementary schools have class sizes that are too large, and it's a it's an empirical study. You can look is is did the people who choose charters uh, spike in those schools where class sizes uh, grew uh, uh, in one particular year over another? Um, uh, thinking that class sizes are out of control in Northampton because of their one experience of the one school that they looked at. Um, uh, and not in, 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 in uh, charters because it's a much more stable, a stable thing. It's just a hypothesis, but that's one thing I was thinking about. I was trying to puzzle out the, the reason why it was such a big issue uh, when it didn't seem to be a major factor, I think, in Northampton. Mm -hmm. I have Ms. Hennessy, and then I have Ms. Fallon, and then Ms. Matt. Just a quick, I would love to see a presentation. I love this. Thank mm. you. Um, of those families of students who come in, back in, both by choice, like I know, you know, we've had students who come in back into elementary school from a charter and certainly to the high school and to, and to hear those reasons. Because um, I think we would, there'd be some contradictions. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just gonna say, I thought it was funny that one of the moves, the one of the thing that prompted people to exit the schools was their fear of budget cuts, and I'm not sure they're relating the fact that the budget cuts <laughs> often occur as a result of people leaving the schools because of the funding formula, and so <coughs> I'm hoping that we can make it clear that if we weren't spending $2 million a year sending it to charter schools, that a lot of those cuts could be restored completely and then some, that we would have great things to do with $2 million extra dollars. Um, and then the other was just that kind of like what Downey was saying, this, that so much of this is based on perceptions. And I know we spend a lot of time at the NEF talking about how to change the perceptions and the same thing with school local. Um, and I think that that's, that really is, I mean, it's kind of a public relations 
relations campaign. Um, and so I just hope that people who feel so strongly about the education their children are getting in the public schools are remembering to talk about it. Do you know what I'm saying? Because that's really what's such a driving factor is to really make it clear that you know you're not doing this because you have no other options. You're doing you you our kids are in public school because it's the best place for them to be, and that you you know you're very happy with your experience. So yeah, and certainly with some of these things, there's a collective action problem, right? Uh, um, yeah, you're worried about budget cuts. You send your kids to charter schools. Budget cuts are more likely to occur. You're worried about not enough high level performing students performing at a high level. You send your kids to a charter school. You send your high-performing <laughs> students to charter schools. There are going to be fewer of them in the public schools. Uh, same thing with involved parents down the line. There are other things, of course, like class size. Everybody in charter schools sort of going to Northampton public schools. Class sizes would probably spike a little bit. Um, uh, so, but yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a, but it's a collective action problem. You're in. You're focusing on your specific child in that specific case, and you're not going to make that decision on that collective action. That's that's why it's a problem. Uh, I have a couple school committee questions. Um, we don't generally entertain questions from the audience, um, so I, I can ask the committee's uh, questions about that, but Ms. Busansky and then Dr. Baird. I'm just going to go, I know we've sort of moved on from this, but just to go back to the class size question again, it's kind of a big question to unpack, right? Because it's not just about, we don't just ask about class, it's class size or the school was too large or you wanted a smaller, personable, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of a big question. It's hard to unpack it. It's kind of point to, oh, it's about class size, right? That's, that's mean, fair. If it's kids moving or parents moving their kids to PVPA, the charter school in seventh or eighth grade, then, you know, they're moving. I think, I think there's an aspect okay. of which class size, another <laughs> hypothesis I have with the class size, and that question in general is that it's really about, um, the amount of direct instruction I get from the teacher or my child gets from the teacher, uh, uh, which is A, possible with a small class, it's B, possible with children who are all learning at the same level. Um, it may be possible when you have two, ch you know, however they structure it, when parents are able to come in and help out with other things so the teacher has more time to teach, whatever that might be. Um, but that might be a, a, a part of that factor is just, the, the perception of reality that in, in, in the charter school that they go to, their child is going to get uh, a lot more attention from a teacher, yeah. which is, yeah, how I've phrased it in those final bullets. Yeah. Dr. Baird? So I was having a conversation with a, a parent in East Hampton that had sought school choice into Northampton and was specifically hoping for Jackson Street or Leeds placement, and it was offered Ryan Road, not the, not the other two schools. I decided then not to pursue it. And I said, like, like what are you talking about? I love Ryan Road. Like, why, like, why are you not, not taking advantage of that? It's like, well, the building looks so old. And I've heard the building is, like, not in good shape. And so it kind of connects back to the library question. Were there any qu questions about facilities as part of the survey? No, no, uh, I don't think we, we didn't ask anything along those lines. That's a good question. Um, uh, uh, no. Um, Okay. I, I've certainly heard people do that with internal district choice, not going to Bridge Street because at the time the playground was a was a, a dirt pit. But uh, maybe they're more going now. Maybe <laughs> going to the kindergarten this year. So we had a, a request for a question or a comment from one of our staff members. I wanted to ask uh, the committee's approval to recognize them, or if someone would like to make a motion to do that. I, I move to recognize her and okay. make comment. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. If you wanted to ask your question. I just wanted to add, I mean, the district is working hard on the curriculum, and the, mass, the DESC just adopted a whole new set of tech standards, and we are perhaps the first state that has added uh, computer science to those tech standards. And so your curriculum teacher leaders are working hard with the tech staff to embed those in all of the lessons that they're developing in apps. That might be another selling feature for the, this very well-educated population that we will prepare their kids for the future. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments uh, from the school committee? Oh, oh uh, Ms. Ag, D Principal Agna. I guess it's an observation and perhaps a question to be asked when you look at the demographics of the parents that you talked about, upper income, highly educated, and the demographics of the student population is there a question to ask that's not just about behavior or bullying, but more about 
whether these are children that they don't want to have their children with or that they perceive as perhaps not um, somewhat taking away from their kids experience in the, in the school. Um, the, it seems so stark to me that there was this yeah. clear demographic of families right. and then the demographic population of the charter school. I mean, you, you can't ask the question, are you not going to <laughs> You don't like the kids in the, I mean, behavior, I thought, that, that was a factor uh, that people were willing to say without having to say it. I, I thought behavior, uh, and I thought uh, kids learning at a higher level in my school would be the two that might show that code for that. Code for that. Behavior showed up, I thought, surprisingly low relative to other items. The, the performing higher, uh, kids performing higher, was a little higher, not as high as I thought it would get, to be honest. Um, uh, and much more, as I said, in Chinese immersion response than hill taxes. Um, so, uh, you know, because that's part of my hypothesis to some degree, that you choose, you know, well, one thing I had to work on going in, you choose right, where your kids are going to be more comfortable, where you're more comfortable, but you can't ask it too directly. And the questions that I think get at it uh, indirectly didn't show themselves uh, that kind of response. And, and yet it did. <laughs> when you asked the first, it was the 50% of the 49, because I thought the same thing, but it was comfortable. And you both said comfort, comfortable. Because I feel like that's the code or the dog whistle word. Um, well, the, the answer. Here, I, I agree with you. Um, the school that uh, we choose offers services classes in a curriculum that was uniquely suited. Oh, comfortable we were environment. concerned that the size of the classes, but this is quite it's back to the whole issue. What did that mean? Or the school was too large. We wanted a smaller, more personal, and more comfortable environment for our child. So I heard it like, right. I, I heard that question like that. And that that was, a lot, was a lot packed in. Yeah, I get it. Um, <coughs> it was up there. Uh, I interpreted it a bit more as being comfortable in the sense of a nurturing environment mm -hmm. uh, from the teacher perspective and the structure of the school perspective. Maybe it also yeah. captures some of that. Again, I, I think if that was a, a big aspect to it, I think, again, behavior and performing at a higher level would be a little higher than it was. And just my opinion. Ms. Fallon. Um, I realize it wasn't within the scope of this um, study, but I think that it's interesting based upon the level of privilege that these students are blessed with that the outcomes there are not even, that they're not, I would like to see what the outcomes are compared to our student population because I suspect that a lot of it has to do with the amount of privilege and the background that they're coming from versus necessarily what's going on in the school. I don't, I wonder if there's a way to separate that out. That's interesting. Because I feel like we're talking about reasons for leaving, but I'm wondering if that would be a very compelling reason to stay if you realize that the outcomes in the public schools are every bit as good, That's if good not point. better, than the outcomes are. Of course, then that addresses the question of how does one judge an outcome and standardized tests, et cetera, but. but yeah, the outcomes, I, they don't seem to be concerned about the outcomes of standardized tests as a measure of anything. I think it's much more specific of what do I feel like my child is getting out of this school. And I guess I would just like to piggyback on that. Like, that's remarkable to me, like that the, we're not concerned about level three designation or yeah. the test scores at all. And, and in fact, um, it was another parent who had moved their, moved their child from one school to the other and, put, and it was an, into a level three school and I was kind of surprised by that. And again, it was the facility. They're like, well, it's just such a nice building and the building looks so nice. And uh, <laughs> you know, it was just really kind of startling to me. But this, this confirmed that, like that people are just, don't seem to be that focused on that. Any other questions? Um, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watts. <laughs> he does have a PhD, yeah. but he earns that title. Um, okay, so um, we will now um, move on to a vote. Uh, this is a budget transfer, uh, $56,396 uh, to create a speech therapy position 
and I believe we have uh, Lori Farkas here um, to uh, our special education <coughs> director to speak to that. I don't have slides. Okay. Um. I can stay in my I can stay in my seat for once tonight. <laughs> um, and this is short. Um, for the past two years, we've been working with uh, an organization, or not an organization, a company called I, which uh, represents uh, speech and language pathologists and some other services. Uh, but the speech and language pathologist is at the PhD level, and she's been supervising our speech and language assistants um, because lately, as we've had some turnover in staff, we've um, had had a hard time hiring speech and language pathologists, which is pretty universal throughout the state, actually probably throughout the country. And so um, we needed um, some supervision of the assistants. And it, when you hire assistants, they cannot do evaluations and they cannot write goals in ed plans. So um, I looked at how much we had been spending on that on that for that contract it was in approximately seventy seven thousand dollars in the past for FY 16 so I proposed to uh, Dr. Provost and to uh, Candy that we um, do this as a point eight position instead which is the amount that's represented here and so we still have hopefully we'll have so we would insource the position, yes. basically. Yes, yeah. and have someone do that supervision as well as the evaluations at the preschool <coughs> level and the high school level. Okay. Any um, questions or comments? Uh, Doc, uh, <laughs> I, Mr. Meyer? Do, do we think we can fill this? Because I know that years ago, one of the problems was we had open positions of speech language pathology, but we never could fill it at the you salary to speak to that? rate. I, I believe we have a very strong indication that we will fill this if this transfer is approved. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I would ask for a motion to approve this uh, transfer, um, this budgetary transfer. Could I have a motion? Second. <laughs> I, thought, I thought she said. I was, I was going to say move to and the whole okay. thing, but so moved. I, I heard it. Okay. <laughs> so the motion is written is moved and uh, seconded. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item is a report uh, from our superintendent evaluation team, and I will turn it over to Ms. Hennessy. Sure. Um, this is the end of a end of cycle summative evaluation report for the superintendent, and you probably all read it. And I won't read all the words except to say that um, it is a complicated and somewhat confusing process. Um, the superintendent sets goals, um, which are both SMART goals and has, then has to meet four standards. Um, and the rating of proficient, which the committee, the subcommittee um, rated him is, and I'm gonna quote this one, is a rigorous expected level of performance. And it is really a rigorous level. Um, so I wanna point that out that uh, proficient to me sounds so blah, <laughs> and yet, um, the work that Dr. Provost has done has been really amazing, and I think we had a really rich conversation. Um, the things that I think stood out for us were how reflective he is, um, the real concrete work he's done, specifically with curriculum, um, which he saw as a great weakness in our district, um, and that uh, his ability to reflect on the work that still needs to be done, specifically around um, family and community involvement. Um, I'm just gonna read the last sentence, if I can which is the district is in the hands of a thoughtful, engaged, and seemingly tireless and in much need of a vacation. That's not, <laughs> that's not part of it um, for next week. And reflective leader who will continue to make our schools places where teachers are fully seen and valued, administrators are given freedom to make positive change and where all students are joyful, actively engaged, challenged, and growing in, into lifelong learners. 
Um, so it is a, a rating of proficient, and yet I just want to highlight that you're modeling so many of the standards that need to be done and moving in a fantastic way, and we're very honored to have you here. Okay. So the other thing that we have on the agenda is a, um, a vote um, in, a, in conjunction with this. Yeah. Um, it's a vote on this um, summer, summative gotcha. evaluation. We so just move would you like to make a motion to on that? accept um, superintendent's summative evaluation of proficient? Okay. Is there a second? So. Seconded by Dr. Baird. Any um, any further discussion or comments? Mr. Meyer. Well, um, I always like to look at the, for educators which districts rate you know how the ratings break down and. In some, in some districts, all the teachers are indeed above average. 90% um, yeah. <laughs> of the teachers in some districts are exemplary, and um, exemplary is supposed like to be. Like Wobegon or something. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, it's much better, <laughs> better than Wobegon because proficient sort of above yeah. that, average. Um, but I just want to say in my time working with Dr. Provost, um, I've been immensely impressed um, by his um, knowledge, by his thoughtfulness, um, and by especially his humanity and dealing with every situation, uh, that's, that's his foundation. Um, and I have, I have experience with a number of superintendents in the state, and uh, I, I place him as the best I've worked with um, and come across. So I want to thank him for his service. Any other comments? OK. So there's been a motion. Uh, made and seconded to approve this accept this uh, summative evaluation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. So uh, we'll now move on uh, to reports, and we have a report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, and I will turn this over now to Ms. Fallon for a series of. Uh, second readings, votes, and first readings on specific matters. Okay, so <clears throat> the first policy that we'll talk about, it's the Rules of Procedure, is our second reading, and we will be voting on it this evening. Um, it's the Revised Rules of Procedure, where the primary revision was to Section 5 um, regarding the Student Advisory Committee, uh, and the other change was made <coughs> Uh, under section 19 of minutes, um, 19.1. Do I need to read through all of the changes? Um, people have them. Right. So, uh, anyone? Can you just, so remind me, because it's they're not yellowed on this, so it was five, which one? Which were the two that changed? Um, oh, five. oh five. okay, right. I know I was in this yeah. subcommittee meeting, but it's been a while. <laughs> and, and then. Yeah, so it's five in section 19.1 under minutes. I, yeah, I don't think I have the original pulled up. Are you asking what the changes were? Uh, where the changes were, yeah, and, and Dr. Provost provided for me. It's 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and then 19.1. And not, yeah. 5.4, there was one line. Oh, right. Uh, struck, and then 19.1, yeah. So, um, you're, you're, you're Clarification is understood. Okay, just want to make sure. Is everybody clear on it before we vote on this? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Because uh, this is the second reading, and it's also we get to take yes, a vote. Yes, this on is it. the only one that we're voting on tonight. Okay. So I wanted to make sure everybody understood what we were doing. Okay. Would you like to make a motion to vote on that? Okay. I move we accept the changes to the rules of procedure. Second. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Okay, so the next um, 
This will be the first reading of school committee legal status, BB revised. Um, there are quite a few changes, but they are all um, essentially due to changes that were made to the Northampton um, city charter. And so they, re they reflect the fact that um, our terms are now two years and not four, um, and, and that we no longer have staggered terms. Uh, and vacancies and how they will be filled. So really it just brings our policy in line with the city charter. Yep. And I won't read it because it's a lot. Okay. So um, any questions about this on first reading? Okay. Okay. Uh, next we have um, policy BBBE. It's also a first reading. Uh, it's unexpired term fulfillment re revised. Um, it also reflects the changes um, to the Northampton City Charger, Charter um, about when vacancies occur for any reason on the school committee um, and how those vacancies will be filled. And I guess to complicate it myself, it occurs to me that part of the language that we're striking is the entire where the announcement will be of the vacancy, how we're filling it, and I'm wondering how people will know that information if it's not anywhere in our policy, what the actual procedure is, because I've also looked at the city charter policy and it doesn't really, the city charter doesn't mention announcements in the Gazette anymore or letters of intent or anything like that. So I don't really know where that information is now in terms of that there's a vacancy to be filled? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if the, when I, yeah, because I filled a vacancy. And so yep. <laughs> I remember the, it was very clear that there was an yep. announcement and that then they told me how to submit a letter of intent and, mm -hmm. and when we, they had two announcements in the Gazette and all that. And that's no longer in the city charter, charter that process. And it's no longer in our policy because our policy was to align with the city charter. So I'm wondering who knows that? How, how does someone go about well, I think the out? charter um, I'm not sure that the former charter had all that information and and the charter now isn't really supposed to be that level of detail it just kind of provides the, the structure, structure. Um, and then it would be up to the City Council coordinating with the chair of the school committee uh, to, to try to get the word out um, that way but, um, you kind of understand my point though yeah I would say we. I would say. Well, for example, we have a vacancy on this on the city council right now, and I don't think there's been any, any lack of public information or public. I think it would. You know, the word has gotten out um, via the media and, and other sources. So I think it would be. I don't know that it's. I'm not sure that you have that as a re, as a requirement in the charter. Um, it's not really that level, but it's okay. also difficult because the school committee alone doesn't control the process. It's right. a joint process between the city council and the school committee right. to fill the vacancy. So, um, I guess I felt like the process should be stated somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and what you're saying is it's not, but that we can trust that the process will, process will be made explicit when an open, opening occurs. That's kind of what I'm saying. Because okay. uh, <laughs> it's not. I mean, it'd be diff I guess because then I guess because the city council would have to align its rules. I don't, I'm not sure that they have anything in their rules about it. Um, yeah, I have their share, but it's not, yeah. it's not to the level of detail that our former policy was. Yeah, it's so i um, not sure what to say on that, other than it's not really appropriate for the charter to have that level of detail. It might be appropriate for our policy. But you could. But we, could but we couldn't establish a policy if it wasn't part of the city council's charter, right? Because he's saying we it wouldn't can't be in opposition that. to it. It wouldn't be. It would just be saying how, like, what this, what what is being struck says that, says that the chairperson of the school committee or a designee who shall cause publication on two occasions, the information, mm -hmm. the yeah. uh, process for how to submit your letter of intent and so yep. forth. Right, but if we're not the ones driving that, if it's also the city council because it's a joint, then they would need to be involved in our policy, right? True, but I don't think it would pre because it's not written wouldn't prevent the school committee from from publicizing that they had a vacancy mm -hmm. and and that there's a going to be a posted meeting of the city council and you know I mean I know the last time we had a vacancy 
i.e. the one we filled with you, I know that there was coordination between the chair and between um, the city council president and, and information was gotten out to the press and where to send your letter of interest and, um, and so they sort of just coordinated that. Okay. Um, so I think it would be. Uh, so you think it's okay to change, make the policy changes that I'm. I think it is. Okay. I think it is. Um, I think it's a rare enough knock on wood occasion thing that, um, but. Well, this begs the question then, or why are we, is it, would you be more comfortable keeping that language that's currently being struck that specifies how it should be publicized? Because I'm curious why that's being struck. Because the charter doesn't list that, the, the, the city charter, and so I, they do talk about how it would be filled, but they just say very vaguely, and so I, I think that we had a decided during subcommittee that we were going to just essentially echo the, the well, language yeah. that was in the city charter. But all we can publish is a legal ad. So if you think a legal ad is going to be, you know, it's widely read by people, I think, I think a press release is probably, I'm just saying that the charter requires us to put legal ads in the right. paper. Like we don't have any authority to say there shall be a front page story <laughs> about this vacancy. So we, all we have is the ability to try to get the press to write a story about it. Because to all you're saying in that rule is that we'll publish a legal ad, right. which is those little things at the back that have small print no and Something. they're for mortgage dis discharges and all kinds of other things that nobody ever reads. Um, so that's, I guess I'm just trying to play devil's advocate on the power of a legal ad. Um, <laughs> I just think there's more, it's more about, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> what's that? <laughs> well, yeah, actually, well, there's that. Well, yeah, it's revenue, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, but it's not exactly like people read legal ads um, necessarily. But. Okay. Well, I'm okay with presenting this as is. Yeah. If no one else has a problem with it. It was just, we were trying to bring all the information in line with the charter as far yeah. as the term length and all yeah. that. But then it occurred to me how will people know our True. process? Yeah. Sorry. It should have occurred to me sooner. That's okay. Um, so that was the first reading on that, and then the final is the first can I reading. Can I ask oh, a question? Sorry. Yes. So I'm just. I apologize, but so between the last two that we've just done, this set, this one has in here 30 days, 120 days, blah blah blah, right? But the one previous says that the um, it'll be filled when it's convenient or. Trying to go back to where it was at. Uh, we'll meet. No, I'm just because it, it says here. I guess my only question is all that stuff that's highlighted in yellow and the one you just went over right. isn't in the one directly previous to that you just discussed. Oh. And I'm wondering if you'd want to have that. That was the from language. the city charter. Yeah. yeah, that's essentially. Then the That's almost identical, the wording. School committee legal status, it's, it does reference if there's a vacancy. Any vacancy occurs will be filled by the joint ballot in a, in a convention at any time. Yet this one we just went over has 30 days or it won't be filled if it's 120 days. So I guess I'm just wondering, do we want to have that same language in that one too? Yeah, so that, these, the wording as it stands now are almost like, I, this is section 4.6, filling of vacancies, article four of chapter C of the city charter. Yep. And the wording is almost identical between the part in yellow and the city charter. Well, my question is, so now, yes, so now you tell me your that question. In the, in the school committee legal status one as well. I think that at any time, just is referring to at any time during the term. So whether it's because because before there was the, the whole complicated thing with the four year terms where if it happened with less than a year to go there was an appointment but if it happened with three years to go there was okay. a special election and so that's what that means you know, I, I think that's what that's about right. yeah right that's the at any time is not not, not a 15 days or 30 days but, but at any time during the term oh. it's vacant I see so maybe we should put in language. Unless to it's that. unless it's 120 days before a municipal election, right. in this case it will and then be. you just wait till the municipal election to fill it. That's right. sort of what <laughs> that's what the change says. Yeah. So there does seem like there might be a consistency issue then, because it's not any time during the term. <coughs> it's within 120 days. 
Right. Then we're going to wait. Right. Uh, yeah, it's it says, um, but then it goes, but it says all that, but then it says no vacancy shall be filled under this section. So, so it has, it's a qualifier. So <laughs> this is the wrong one. Yeah, I, whatever it's. Uh, so are you saying uh, you'd just like us to add in um, at any time unless there are less than 120 could, days left in the term or something? Yeah, it's an act of the legislature. I so. just, I just, now we're trying to clarify this policy to be right. consistent yeah. with the charter and I'm just wondering. No, but uh, so I, I'm, I'm just now catching up with you. I'm a yeah. little slow tonight. So, <laughs> so what you're saying is where that any vacancy occurring shall be filled by the joint ballot ballot uh, of the city council and school committee and convention at any time you're questioning whether we need to make it clear unless there's less than 120 days left I guess so Was, would that make it consistent can I recognize our neighborhood lawyer here? So, <laughs> so so typically this is dealt with by placing a notwithstanding the above language mm -hmm. comma see when you put in the magic words notwithstanding the above it means all that goes away and if it's within 120 days, then there's no election. So it's a way of it's a way of saying unless. It's a standard way of saying unless. Why aren't you on this subcommittee? I don't. Know. So, so you could just you put, would say at the at the very end there where you've got that no vacancy, you could just say notwithstanding the language above, right, or notwithstanding the previous verbiage. If a regular city election is to be held within 120. No, no vacancy shall be filled if a regular city election is to be held within 120 days following the date the vacancy is to be <laughs> It should be, no vacancy should be filled in this manner in the section because otherwise it says it should never be filled. It's like, we just ended up with a trip. Well, well, I wonder if you could just say it, it right. would be yeah. filled this shall not following this one now. policy, blah, 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 and just <laughs> reference then this other policy. Right. So we'll do some <laughs> yeah, it's... We, this is a first reading, so we have time. Yes. To so, that. Okay, so as a first reading, then is someone marking this down so that they can amend it for the second reading? Yeah. Sure. Because I didn't. County's all over it. And again, it's all. Mr. Meyer? This is just, <laughs> these are just policies. Yeah. So okay. Just policy. I'm just saying that they not have this policy and it would still be what's in the charter, so it's fine. Whatever you need. <laughs> Should I move on to the last one? Yeah. Did you get that, Downey? Yep. yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> on to the next one. So the last one is so much simpler. The last one is a first reading of school committee member compensation and expenses um, BID, um, and it reflects reflects also the change um, in compensation for school committee members, um, and that's. Pretty much it. I think that one's very straightforward. Okay. Is everybody happy with that one? Okay. okay. So, um, so that that completes the um, first readings on those three items, and those will come back to you at your next meeting for second reading and vote. Correct. Thank you. Anything else to report from? The, oh, I sorry. Know. I just had a question. You, this is just something. Look, I don't. I don't even understand what I read a couple days ago. I don't understand still. Um, the last line, the visitations word. What is? I don't. I don't know what visitations are. I guess maybe is the problem. There's like a semicolon after professional meetings. Visitations when such attendance. Makes sense. I don't know. It just seemed like a weird cut and paste thing. I don't know. How do you even read that? So maybe we should find out. It's like in it's like in a Christmas. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like Scrooge. You're <laughs> <laughs> right. It is. I need to copy edit. You know what? That is because it came directly from the Massachusetts Association of School Committee Members sample. Um, yeah. If you are not comfortable with visiting, I just don't even know what it means. You could go Does like it mean on, visiting yeah. other schools and oh, like a visitation yeah. with yeah. yeah. When you go visit another school yeah. and a junket, junket. <laughs> <laughs> as, well, as long as it had prior committee approval. <laughs> we don't do that a lot. It sounds Howard like you're suggesting that the semicolon be replaced with something like an and or. 
Would that? Sure. The Would that do it? It might be a punctuation problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do you want to just get rid of visitation, of visitations yeah. and the semicolon? Well, not if visitations mean something, then I'm happy to keep it in. But if it makes more sense to not have yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has the potential to, you know, mean something and it's probably innocuous enough to leave in. <laughs> I thought it was <laughs> Okay, so that's duly noted by the committee chair. For duly the next, noted. For the second reading. Okay. Anything else before we move on? Okay, so we'll move on now to um, a required vote, and this is a determination of public purpose consortium for educational change grant for turn conference expenses, and uh, Dr. Provost, would you like to explain uh, this particular clause of the state ethics sure. law? Thank you. Okay. Um, when a public official receives um, a travel expense in excess of $50, it needs to be um, approved by the appointing body. So for teachers and administrators who attend um, typically field trips, often the cost of the field trip is paid for by the PTO or by s some agency that's sponsoring. And I say, well, you know, they're doing it for the kids and it's a legitimate public purpose. In this case, um, I have a grant, I have an opportunity to attend the um, regional turn conference and the teachers reform, <coughs> teachers union reform network is willing to pay for me and a team of educators to attend. Um, I attended this conference last year at district expense. It, I found it to be a very fruitful um, conference. For those of you who are avid district improvement insider readers, the idea for that was sort of hatched at the conference last year. So I don't know what will come out of this. But <coughs> I in particular am looking forward to attending the session by Dr. Saul Rubenstein. Um, I've been reading his research through our work with the DCP. He really is, um, the researcher in the field um, looking into how labor and management relationships, collaboration can support student achievement. And so um, I I'm, will attend all the sessions, but I'm particularly looking forward to seeing that. And I'm just looking for um, my appointing body's determination that attending that conference at the uh, expense of the turn associate organization serves a legitimate public purpose. Okay, so does everyone understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would move an affirmative determination of public purpose. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any <coughs> other discussion about this? So is this a visitation or a junk? <laughs> <laughs> but given that he's not taking his vacation time, I think even if it was a junket, it would be acceptable for me. Any other questions? Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and we need, that needs to be signed. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, we'll make sure that gets taken care of. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is a vote to accept a gift. Uh, this is from Stop and Shop. It's $7,236.43 to Northampton High School. And I'll ask Ms. Walzak to explain. This gift is a result of parents signing up to have a shop directly to the school. So thank you to all the parents who've done that. Um, the high school received this seven thousand dollars and change this year, and what they're doing, and what they've traditionally done is split that between the athletic department and I'll call it the general high school operating. So half of this money would be directed to the athletic gift account, and the rest of it would go into the high school gift account for programs that the principal would deem appropriate. Any questions about this gift? Not a question, but I just want to add, I know that the NHS PTO has done a huge drive over the last couple of years to get parents to sign up, and parents can actually sign up for two schools. So if you have your child in more, <coughs> children in more than one in the uh, Northampton Public School, you can actually sign up for, say, NHS and Ryan Road or <laughs> some other school. Like that. So I'll just point that out. So it's a great opportunity, as you can see, to raise some money for your school since lots of us shop there. Okay. Could I get a motion to accept that gift on that note? Motion to accept that gift. Okay. Second. <laughs> Second. Uh, did you have a question? This no. One? Okay. 
<laughs> okay, quickly, let's vote. All those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Sorry, I was just signing this ethics form so <laughs> keep the superintendent legal. Um, okay, the next item is a vote to accept a gift. This is NHS PTO, $1,810, um, and material gifts to NHS Fine Arts Department. Ms. Walsick? Yes, this is a, a combination as mentioned. So they'll make a cash donation for $1,810. There was an attachment included in the email to you that lists what that would be used for. And then they will be directly purchasing some supplies and paying for field trips that have a value of $3,819.29. A combination of giving us money to do certain things that we can buy better and other things where they will pay directly. Any questions about that? Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Okay. With an expression of gratitude for the over $14,000 in gifts we're going to be approving tonight. Okay. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That, that gift is also accepted. Next, we have a bid award. Uh, this is to award a bid for the uh, resurfacing and crack sealing of the tennis courts, I assume at JFK. Yes. Okay. Yep. Do you want to speak to this? Yep. This was one of the capital funded projects for this year was to repair the cracks and then resurface the entire area so that we can get back into some better playing on the tennis courts. There was also an alternate bid to do some repairs to an adjoining basketball court and the, the bids came in low enough that the recommendation is to also award the alternate so that the basketball court can also be repaired. The total of all of that, the tennis and basketball courts, comes out to $41,700, with the low bid being by East Coast Seal, Co Seal Coating, Inc. Okay. Any questions about that bid award? Hearing none, could I get a motion to, a, to award this bid? Move award of the bid as described. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of awarding the bid, please say aye. <coughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. We'll now move into the business administrator's report. Yep. This is very short tonight, um, primarily because we have no budget report for you. We're in the process of closing out the books. So I would expect that the August school committee meeting will have a complete financial report for you on the closing of FY16. Um, when we have in the past accepted gifts in advance so that an outside group can go ahead and raise money in our name, I've tried to come back to you after and let you know the outcome of it. So back in March, you accepted a gift in advance from the Green Street Brew for their local local cord bowl. They estimated the donation would be in the vicinity of $2,000, and it actually came in at $3,000. The check was just received, and it's been distributed to all of the buildings to support the music program. And they'll be making those purchases, hopefully, this summer of materials. And then the last one are the gifts that come in that are approved by principals and the superintendent in accordance with your policy. There was only one PTO gift um, this month accepted by a principal. It was at JFK. There was a gift of $40 from the PTO to help fund a grade eight French trip. And then there were five gifts under $1,000 accepted by the superintendent. Um, four of them were for JFK. One was from the Clark Art Museum to fund a field trip to the museum in the amount of $550. One was from Smith College to also help pay for an art museum trip in an amount of $175. Um, Gregory and Kathleen Malinowski made a $50 donation towards a water bottle filling station. The students are raising money at the school through the um, Environmental Club to buy a second one. They purchased one last year and they're raising money to purchase a second one where they can actually go in with their refillable water bottles and, and do it that way. Um, and the fourth one for JFK was from Edwards Church, and that was um, for student help during the day of service that the middle school held. All four of those donations will actually go into the middle school student activity account because that's where the other fundraising money related to these projects are. And then the last donation was to the Northampton Prevention Coalition from the Northwest DA's office. It was a $400 donation to support the Prevention Coalition community outreach efforts. So personnel report? Yep, during June, obviously the end of the school year, so we had a number of separations. Um, 
we had a total of 13 staff members, seven teachers, three ESPs, and three other staff members leave the district. At the same time, we had 10 retirements, which were recognized at the last meeting. Um, and then we've had one um, promotion basically within the system. The Ananda Lennox, who was our youth development and parent engagement coordinator, has moved into the position of the coalition coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Any questions about personnel report? Okay. Hearing none. You guys got to like move your hands. <laughs> or it makes the lights go back on or something. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, okay. Uh, That's right. Okay, so next we'll turn to the superintendent's report and Dr. Provost. Thank you. The facilitator opened yesterday's refugee settlement steering committee by asking us to speak about what was on our hearts. Although we represented many different types of agencies, our hearts were all very much in the same place. One after another, we all, all discussed how discouraged, angry, and saddened we were by the spate of individual and mass shootings um, that have taken place recently. Sorry, this is a little tough for me. Um, in the four weeks since the last school committee meeting, there have been 51 mass shootings in the United States. They've resulted in 99 fatalities, 233 non-fatalities, and those numbers don't include individual acts of violence, casualties of war, police shootings, or any act of violence outside the U.S. borders. It's such a loss, and I'm sure it's going to go on this month and the next month and the month after that. And I'm sure it's something that's on all of your hearts as well. And it makes me wonder whether we're asking the right questions. Spent a lot of time discussing MCAS scores and AP scores and the BAS. When do we ask whether we're doing anything to make our students better people and not just smarter people? That's what I've been asking myself these past several weeks, and I'm sure that it'll come as no surprise to you that I've wanted my inquiry to be data informed. Having approved the JFK School Improvement Plan, you know that implementing restorative justice was an important goal for the middle school. The evidence base for restorative practices suggests that it's a useful approach not only for reducing school-based misbehavior, bullying, and violence, but also for reducing future crime and criminal recidivism. We, took, we look at the, the past and the current data to make inferences about what the future might bring. If restorative practices are likely to make students less violent, and more civil, civically engaged adults in the long run, they should improve student discipline in the short run. So I look to the end of the year student safety and discipline report as a leading indicator on whether we're producing students who are more likely to grow up to be good people. And I find that the impact of restorative practices at JFK has been dramatically positive. I think you will too. During the 2014-15 school year, prior to implementing restorative practices, 127 total students were suspended from the middle school for 291 days. In the year that just ended, after implementing restorative practices, 26 students were suspended for a total of 72 days. That's an 80% reduction in the number of students suspended and a 75% reduction in time spent out of school due to suspension. In the long run, this may be an outcome that's more important for all of us than increased test scores. And that's my report. Thank you. Okay, so we do not have any new business. Um, I do need to announce that we do have some future business and meeting dates. The school committee's regular meeting will meet on August 11th, 2016, 7.15 p.m. here at JFK. And then the negotiating subcommittee uh, scheduled for August 18th, uh, 2016 at 3 p.m. Um, at JFK. We also, Mr. Mayor, the, sorry. there's actually a correction. That date is now August the 19th. August 19th. August 19th at 9 a.m. At JFK. At JFK, okay. 
speaker in the community room. Okay. Uh, I now have uh, the next item on the agenda um, is a request for an executive session in the JFK Principals Conference Room. And I would ask. Uh, so I would move that we enter executive session for the approval of executive session minutes to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, to conduct negotiations with the Northampton Association of School Employees, and to discuss strategy in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into executive session. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Dr. Baird seconds. Okay, I will ask the clerk to call the roll for uh, yay or nay votes to go into executive session. Okay. Yes. 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 So I do need to announce to the public that the uh, school committee will now move into executive session uh, where because an open session would have a detrimental effect um, and further details about that session would compromise the reason for going into executive session. I also need to announce to the public that we will adjourn directly from executive session. Uh, with that, we will now move into the executive session.